to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to another episode of the What Bitcoin Did podcast. This week I have my second interview with Jamie Burke from Outlier Ventures. Jamie was the fifth guest on the podcast and if you haven't heard that episode there will be a link to that in the show notes. But before I discuss the show I just want to talk a little bit about sponsorship. I've been getting quite a few inquiries now about people who want to advertise on the podcast which is obviously very cool. It allows me to focus on the show rather than training which I'm rubbish at. And the first paid advertiser will hit next week. So I decided what I would do this week is use the podcast and uh, the reach I've created to give a shout out to a a few uh, projects. I've not been paid for any of this, but I just thought it'd be a nice chance to shine a light on some uh, interesting things that are happening. So first up, I'd like to give a shout out to my friend Suna's project, which is Token Daily. I've been a subscriber of that for a while now. I love what she is doing. It's definitely one of the best ways to find out the latest in crypto and blockchain. She covers interesting new project launches. There are high quality think pieces and also trending news. So you can subscribe to her newsletter by heading over to tokendaily.co forward slash join hyphen newsletter and also check out the website actually there's some really interesting q a's she does on there i particularly like the one with nick carter and i'll also add a link to that in the show notes secondly please check out sarah's coffee which is at sarahscoffee.com where each purchase supports the carrier project which is her charity to send disability equipment to people in need in africa so that's obviously a very cool project worthy of having a look and another cool thing is that sarah has also been selling her coffee on open bazaar where she's been accepting payment in crypto so that's that's obviously pretty damn cool. So please do check out sarahscoffee.com. And lastly, I would like to give a shout out to the work John Sanchez is doing with the charity The Water Project, where they fund wells and other methods to provide safe, cleaner water to those who don't have it. John has also created a campaign called Crypto to Change the World to firstly help the cause, but secondary to showcase the given ability of the crypto community as a whole. So you can check that out at charitywater.org and I'll also add a link into the show notes to John's specific campaign. Okay, please do take the time to check out these projects. Um, In future, there will be more ads and they do help support the show. And also, look, if there are any other charities out there and you you would like me to kind of help out and shine a light on what you're doing, please do feel free to DM me or drop me an email. I'll happily use a bit of the spare inventory to highlight any uh, worthy projects. I know what it's like trying to get reach and you might not always have the budget. So do feel free to get in touch. Okay, so moving on to this week's show, following on from my interview with Pierre last week and looking at Bitcoin maximalism, it's kind of raised a number of questions to me around token-based projects. So I decided this week I wanted to interview someone more in that space to throw a few of the concerns or questions I had. So it was quite natural for me to approach Jamie. Um, I really like the guy. Uh, I really like what he's doing. So yeah, this week me and Jamie discussed token economies. We also look into the FAT protocol thesis, which Jamie also wrote a supporting piece called The Hungry Protocol, which is worth a look. And we also discussed some work he did writing about the path to decentralization. There are links to all of this in the show notes. Um, The FAT protocol thesis also, a few people have shared it. I have my concerns that I think it has some flaws. So I think it is definitely a worthy area to look into okay before we move on to the interview please do support the show please do go and leave me a review on itunes if you think i deserve a five star review that's obviously awesome please do follow me on social media i'm at what bitcoin did on everything i will probably get back to you if you reach out to me please do check out my website www.whatbitcoindid.com it needs a bit of work now uh, my recent bitcoin investigation like the work i've been doing looking into bitcoin maximalism has changed my views on things so there's probably some work i need to do to update that but feel free to go and take a look lots of useful info there and please do share out the show with your friends and family because it really does help okay uh, lastly i am off to la on monday i'm going to be there for three weeks but doing a short trip out to san francisco as well i'm looking for really interesting and leading people in the space to interview if you've got any recommendations recommendations or if you want to come on the show please do reach out to me um also if anyone wants to meet up or any meetups are happening that are worth attending give me a shout i would love to uh, pop by and meet some of you people okay so on to the interview i hope you enjoy it if you do have any questions do feel free to reach out to me my email address is hello at what bitcoin did.com and i pretty much reply to everyone um eventually so okay hope you enjoy the interview <laughs> hi jamie good to see you again hey there yeah good to see you um, so quite a lot's happened since we last met um, for you, for Outlier, the market. And for you. And for me, yes, for me, I've uh, I found myself learning a lot more, finding I'm asking more questions and finding that the, the more you learn about crypto, the less you think you know. 
I don't know if you ever feel like that. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's incredibly overwhelming space, and um, it's getting more complex, not not less. So, you know, just trying to keep up pace with that, even with the amount of people that we have at Outlier now, you know, almost 30 people and full time. And, and, and still it's almost an impossible task to, to track it all, to understand it. Um, especially when you're running a business, right? You know, you're not just reading white papers all day. So uh, you're looking after the operational stuff that goes with, with running a, a growing company. And you now have a US outfit? Yeah, so um, we recently announced uh, that Rumi Morales uh, was joining us to head up the kind of North American office. Uh, obviously, we already have a, an office in Toronto, uh, but nothing uh, formally in, in the States. So she's based out of Chicago, um, ex uh, ran the venture arm at um, CME Ventures. Um, and did a number of investments, actually very in line with the convergence thesis. So it was amazing that we'd not really heard of each, each other until recently when we got introduced. Um, so she invested in uh, uh, Ripple, the company, um, digital assets holding, digital currency group, um, and also a number of IoT and AI companies. Okay. And I also met with Toby from Fetch a few yes. weeks ago, which yeah. is another one of yours. That Great was... podcast. Thank you. Uh, really interesting. A really interesting project, and I've also been really enjoying your newsletter. I think I think you launched that not long after we spoke, and there's probably three or four really good newsletters in the space, actually. I think I find better than almost any other industry I've worked in. There's yours, the Dio one, uh, Pomp's got an off-the-chain one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much work goes into the I uh, can newsletter? I can happily say that I have very little to do with it. Oh. So, um, uh, so it, it's kind of... Really run across um, Lawrence Lundy's team, our head of research. Uh, there's a guy called Joel um, out of India who's very involved, um, and then also a number of other analysts in the team that kind of plug that gap. But yeah, no, it's, it's a great, great newsletter. We always have um, so many people discover us through that newsletter. And um, uh, sometimes I refer to it as kind of an espresso shot of, of, of crypto news, but also a bit more expanded around convergence and stuff. So Yeah, no, it's very useful. I'll share it out in the show notes so people can uh, subscribe and see it as well. So when we first met, you called for a, a haircut. You said the uh, market was getting out of hand. We needed a haircut, 50% ideally. Actually, I think you said 50%, but ideally up to 80%, uh, which we've now had. And uh, one of the interesting things I found through going uh, through a bear market, which is nothing I've ever experienced before, I'm, I'm previously advertising like you, is you actually ask more critical questions now. Um, and my overriding thought is that we're still in this huge test. And <laughs> does anybody really know where value will be created? And, and this is kind of one of the themes what I want to talk to you about today. But how are you feeling since the... Big drop. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I forget when we actually did the podcast, but I, I did a, a post, um, I think it was called Back to the Back to the Future, um, which was in the first or second week of January um, and was really based upon, you know, internally the outlier um, with the kind of peaks of, of December, uh, the, the prior December. It, it really felt like there was no correlation between underlying value in the market and the, the pricing and, and the money that's being thrown around. And of course, nobody minded because everyone's making lots of money. Um, but there was a huge disconnect. And, uh, you know, because we're primarily focused on infrastructure, uh, you saw the amount of projects that were raising money on the assumption that there would be an infrastructure for their application to work on. And they were trying to execute all these um, kind of market layer opportunities. And the infrastructure's just wasn't there and it still isn't there um and to your point you know we're we're just going through it's one big experiment in a number of different things some technological um some around kind of governance um and then you know linking all that together with with tokens kind of socioeconomics so there's so much complexity in there um and there's so many things that we need to figure out um, that it's it's an amazing intellectual exercise. It is very difficult to invest in, um, uh, and it does require, you know, a kind of lot of diligence and, and thought to be put in. Uh, and to be honest, you just exposure to the market to be just seeing the sheer volume of things coming coming at you allows you to spot trends 
Um, and, you know, hopefully we've got a, a, a good team that allows us to, when we, when we spot something that we think is interesting, to, to, to have the resource to be able to explore it with some depth. I, the way I um, split it up now for me is I see it as Bitcoin and everything else. And I think for me, Bitcoin is semi-proven in that there are some use cases. Uh, I, buy, I buy into the digital gold store of value. I understand that, though I still think there are uh, questions to be asked. Uh, I find the use case of what's actually happening in Venezuela interesting. I interviewed uh, Alejandro Macedo, uh, who is a uh, writer for Caracas Chronicles, and I find what happening, is happening there is interesting. And there's certainly use cases that are proven. I then think everything else, uh, there's a lot more questions around protocols and dApps. Yeah. And that's the area now that I want to explore because it's probably the area I'm struggling most with. And, and the question I keep asking myself is, where is the value? Where is value being created? And I know you've been looking at this and you're interested in uh, the FAT protocol thesis, but also your own work on the Hungry protocols. So can we explore that for a bit? Can, can you talk to me about where you think value is or will be generated? Because obviously that's central to your business. Yeah. So... We do you know, broadly subscribe to Joe Monegro's uh, flat, FAT protocol thesis. Um, but obviously, and it was, it was deliberately you know, a high-level concept. Um, and of course, you know, value is much more nuanced and complex than that. Um, and uh, there's been some interesting critiques of it recently. Jake uh, Brookman of CoinFund um, did a really interesting post well, he, he totally dismissed the idea of investing uh, as a thesis into um, uh, the FAT protocol. Um, and he, his kind of central argument was really that um, where does the protocol start and end? You know, there's so many things that could be regarded in one sense as a protocol and in the other sense, uh, an application of another protocol. Um, so, you know, it's not kind of uh, binary or, or clear, even as a definition, just the word protocol in and of itself. So, and this is, of course, one of the age-old problems with crypto is we get so bogged down in definitions, people get so dogmatic um, about what that means. So for me, the fact protocol as a thesis um, is, is a kind of a general statement about what could be different in Web3 versus Web2. And the idea that... Uh, no commercial value resided in the protocol layer um, in Web 2, uh, Web 1 and Web 2. Um, and the idea that that could be flipped on its head in Web 3. Now, um, I don't think it's as clear cut as saying uh, th all the value will be in the uh, protocol layer and no value will be in the application layer for the very reason that Jake flagged, which is um, there's an interplay between uh, different protocols. Um, but for us, I think if we look at where we are in the cycle, and I think that's the most important way um, when considering your thesis is, you know, at, at what point in the cycle are you investing? And for us, um, there is still so much infrastructure that is yet to be proven, is yet to be built, and is probably yet to even be thought of. Um, and there will be a lot of value that accrues in those protocols. Now, whether it's all the value um, is to be seen, and it's unlikely uh, to be the case, but certainly a significant amount of value, if you were to uh, enable a protocol for, say, identity like Sovereign is trying to do, uh, an identity not just for people, but for things, for agents, objects, um, if you were able to tokenize that, which is what they're trying to do, um, and that were to become the identity layer and standard for the web, that is a pretty significant um, investment opportunity from our perspective. Um, equally, uh, if you were to create protocols um, that may be oriented around um, enabling data marketplaces such as Ocean, um, enabling um, autonomous economic agencies like Fetch, um, uh, then you know, these are significant building blocks um, I think Jake's argument was it's going to be very difficult to pick those winners. Um, and uh, so it really comes down to the confidence of your ability to 
um, not just select, but inform investments. And this is, I guess, why... Wasn't his argument that you should have a broad investment across all the protocols? Yeah, which is a classic VC approach, which yeah. is just shotgun. And I'm not, not, that's not what they do. But his argument was, you know, if you're going to follow, follow his line of thinking, then you should diversify as much as possible, including into competitors' protocols, because there's always going to be this interplay. Um, but, you know, where we're, where we're focused is being able to inform um, effectively value traps. So if you think about what token design is um, and, you know, the kind of new framing of that is token engineering. And we're, we're very involved in a number of Trent's um, token engineering meetups, um, uh, both Toronto, London and there's a number of others around the world. They're really focused upon how do you uh, leverage a token to um, incentivize and disincentivize certain behaviors in a, in a particular system. So that can be, um, you know, there's a, there's a reward for certain behaviors or certain contributions to the network, but equally there's a cost. There's a cost to misbehaving in that system. Um, and I think, um, you know, that's, that's a, a really important concept if you think about what's different now to conventional open source systems Previously, there was no cost to misbehaving. Um, you could pretty much do what you want. And equally, there was no in incentive, so there was some network effect. Um, but that can obviously be amplified by having a, a direct monetary incentive uh, for, for positive behavior. Um, and so you know, what, what that means is by introducing a token into the system is you know, we're moving away from forking a bit of open source technology that's not tokenized. It's really just... Uh, creating a, a slightly different technical pathway. Um, but there isn't really any economic consequence to that, whilst if you have a tokenized economic, um, a tokenized open software system, uh, aptly abbreviated TOS, um, <laughs> then, uh, then there, are, there are much greater implications to a fork, right? You, you're forking an economy, not just um, a te technical pathway. Um, and so, you know, we believe that having tokenized protocols, there's going to be a huge opportunity. It doesn't mean it's always going to be executed well, but there's a huge opportunity to trap value within um, this economic system at the protocol layer. Um, that doesn't mean that that protocol, protocol can't interplay with another protocol. It, it doesn't mean that um, applications can't build value on top of it. Um, but primarily, if you're looking at these kind of general purpose protocols, but they're equally solving a particular infrastructure problem, um, then there's a huge, huge opportunity. One of the things I've struggled with this, therefore, as somebody who's considered investing and also looking at the retail market, which has been invested in this primarily, actually, and probably shouldn't be, is that for for most of these tokens to accrue value, there has to be some form of scarcity engineered into it. And therefore, I find that there's almost very complicated economies being uh, being built, and I'm struggling to see the reason for it. So I, I think of Augur as a good reason, and I think it's very impressive what they've done. But at the same time, it's a very complicated product, very complicated for new users to set themselves up. And I think what the reflection, and that's reflected in the number, of, I don't know if you saw the other day, the number of daily users, which sure. is very low. And I'm wondering whether there is going to be a market need for these token economies. Sure. Do you see what I'm struggling with? Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's probably going to be true, like in most tech cycles, that the first attempts at something won't be the ones that succeed. Because um, there's so many learnings that you're going to have when you know, the rubber hits the tarmac. Um, and this actually feeds into something I guess we might talk about a little bit later, which is there's been this rush to codify rules, governance into protocols, um, assuming that you can, get it, every, you can get everything right, every decision you're going to make right, you can preempt. Um, and that these things are going to survive intact. And the problem is that kind of rush to codify everything and anything, including governance and coders law and all these various things, uh, is that you're building something that's incredibly fragile. 
um, because one of those assumptions at least is definitely going to be wrong. Um, and this is why you then see what's plagued the crypto space is the kind of threat of a hard fork um, because certain decisions that people couldn't predict come about and it could be as simple as a hack and all of a sudden there's a constitutional crisis um, about how, um, how that is responded to. And so, you know, one of the things that we encourage is there's kind of two sides to it. So we, we've got a crypto economics team and function out of Toronto, the team of quants, and they spend a huge amount of time um, modeling out these economies, thinking through adversarial attacks, thinking through inflation schedules, thinking through supply. Um, but there's a huge amount of assumptions there. And you can see that if you change one variable in their model, um, it can break the model or it has unintended consequences. Um, so, um, so, you know, you model as best as you can, but then in parallel, you allow for more kind of agile and what I call wet uh, decision making. Um, so in the beginning, I actually think it's probably quite sensible um, for certain aspects of a network to be quite centralized. Um, as you're trying to figure out um, to kind of borrow lean startup terminology, network market fit. So everybody's, you know, you kind of got two layers running in parallel to one another. And the goal is to get, to have the, the protocol meet a need for a market and ideally several markets um, over a period of time. Um, but to, to kind of, you know, until you achieve that, effectively you haven't established whether any of your design decisions make any sense. Okay, that's kind of interesting as well, especially as you brought up the uh, lean methodology mm. because, you know, you and I both from a digital advertising background will be aware of when Eric Ries released the Lean Startup yeah. and it became a Bible for uh, product development and product market fit and the minimum viable product. And I think I read in, was it in your article, you talked about a minimum viable community. Yeah, so Which, uh, sorry, we've got a few say, minimal viable things. So, But I found that really interesting, actually, is because what I find a lot of what's been developed in crypto is um, it's almost we've gone back not just one step, but a number of steps of what the startup world has learned in that Eric Ries would encourage you to get a minimum viable product out really quick. And whatever you think your minimum product is, it's even smaller than that. And you'd get out there and test your assumptions. Yeah. Whereas something like Augur appears to have spent three years to get to its relief. And I, obviously, I don't know the development process. Sure. In, in, but do you, have, do you have to be decentralized when you're building a minimum viable product or community to test your thesis? Yeah. Well, yeah, so th this is it. It's very easy to intellectualize many of the problems that the crypto community is, is, is faced with as it looks forward into its future and starts to think about what's going to be required to scale all this stuff to allow for retail users, to allow for institutional money to flow in. Um, and you're right, one thing that's been missing is pragmatism. And so there's been a lot of dogmatism, especially around decentralization. Um, and so obviously there are some aspects of decentralization that in, are integral to something like Bitcoin. You know, you need high degrees of decentralization in certain aspects of it to allow for the security. Its whole value proposition, its objective function, the thing that it's trying to optimize for is security. Um, but uh, that doesn't always make sense for other projects. And so there's kind of trade-offs that need to be made. And I think what we're starting to see now is this kind of the, the first wave um, of innovators in the space were very dogmatic um, and uh, were intellectualizing things far too much. Um, and actually, it's because a lot of them didn't have any startup experience. Um, so it's very easy to build mathematical models and all this kind of stuff, but um, you know, to actually take a startup out there and, and figure out nobody wants it, even though you know um, they should, and even though you know the product is going to solve lots of pain points in their lives, but no nobody uses it. Um, so... You know, really what we try to encourage is, so our, some of our projects uh, will be two years before there's a live token. So Fetch, for example, by the point that they uh, sell a token to the public will probably be two years before we began our engagement with them. So we, we're, we're guilty of it a bit as well. 
Um, but that's largely because, you know, they've built an entirely new protocol um, and um, uh, a unique kind of combination of consensus algorithms to serve specifically machine learning. So th there's a huge amount of R&D that had to go into that. But in parallel, you're going, okay, well, then how people are going to use this? And you're modeling it out. Um, and, you know, you can do degrees of user testing. So we, we do uh, testing with Imperial College. We give people, you know, decisions to make um, uh, based upon certain incentives and disincentives and see how they perform to test the kind of game theory. Um, but, but ultimately, the best way to test it is to get people to be using it at scale. And, um, and when it comes to that, I think the important thing is to have a governance or layers of governance that allow you to adapt to what the, the market tells you um, without leading to um, a couple of things. One is you know, contentious forks, splits within the community. You need to be able to carry the majority of the community. Um, and, um, and, and the second one is value leakage. So you know, one of the key things around token engineering and optimization for token design is how, how do you allow the system that you're building to retain as much value as possible? Um, and so they're the kind of things you're designing for, and then there'll be um, uh, an optimization function. What is the kind of core thing you're trying to optimize the network for? And Trent... Um, Trent of Ocean, Big Chain DB, did a really interesting presentation recently. I saw with a kind of a CEO of a very large public company, it was a, a kind of a private CEO dinner, um, and you know he, he just said, "Look, you know, there's many criticisms around Bitcoin and how inefficient it is." Um, but he pulled up a picture of a massive server farm, and he says, "Look at what billions of dollars have optimized for." You know, totally decentralized networks of people have contributed massive amounts of hardware and energy and really optimize that um, very specific to the objective function of that network. And it's mobilized billions. Um, so you know, that is the potential if you can design a system um, properly um, and you can allow for, with all the hindsight that we've now got of watching the ideals of things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and where they've struggled, um, it's hard to be the first, it's hard to be the second, it's hard to be the third. Um, and what can we borrow from those learnings? And I think most of the learnings will be around governance, actually, hopefully. Do you, do you think the general public will really care about decentralization? No, I mean, I, I, I don't. Um, and I, again, this is what are you selling? So if you're selling decentralization, there's a very small, part, uh, very small market of people that are wanting to buy that thing. Yeah. Um, so sadly, the people that care about self-sovereign identity and data and all these things are very few. The, at the end of the day, the product is going to have to be faster, cheaper, and the experience is going to have to be equal to, if not better than, the incumbent mm -hmm. experience. And if it's none of those things, um, then uh, it's going to really struggle to be adopted. Because you know, if you think about how many things in your life you do or you use, even though um, they'd be better for you uh, on a number of a number of measures, um, just because it's easier. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm morally opposed to Uber, but I still use it because it's just, you know, if I'm flying around from city to city, um, I, can, I, can, I can get a taxi anywhere in the world without having to reinstall a new app. So I have the same feeling about Amazon. Yeah. Right. I mean, I just think it's a, if you look at it morally, it's a horrible business, yeah. the way they treat their staff, uh, the destruction to small business, um, the monopolies they've created, but at the same time, I always end up using it just because it's front of mind and yeah. it's easy to use. And that's why when somebody spoke to me recently, they said, well, wouldn't it be great if, if we could build a decentralized Facebook because then they couldn't sell our data? And I just said, but nobody will care. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, well, the, the thing is... Or small people, Matt, will care. Yeah, well, the, the thing is that one of the interesting concepts about tokenization, when you think of it as... Uh, as a form of equity or ownership of a network is that the, the users can own the network and therefore there's an alignment that the problem with things like Facebook or even Amazon is there's a misalignment of the user and the shareholder. So if they're one and the same thing, you would hope the end outcome would be a more aligned um, ethically and, and, and socially uh, better aligned um, uh, solutions and protocols out there. Um, but at the end of the day, yeah, if it's not, if it's going to cost me more, 
if it's going to take me longer, if it's going to be an inconvenience, the, the barrier to adopting that for the, the mass of people is going to be too high. And that's where I think I then go back to having quite a big problem with Augur in that if I want to, yes, Augur might have some quite unique betting markets. I can, you yeah, know, recently they've had the assassinations. Right. But um, generally speaking, they do have some quite unique betting markets. But I don't think there's a huge demand for those. I think it's niche and it's kind of interesting. Um, my problem is for most people to download and set up, it's a pain. And another thing that's crossed my mind recently also is that um, I think decentralized and um, anonymous uh, base products are going to have a harder job at building traction and retention because they're not going to have the tools that we've had in traditional digital marketing to talk to their customers. Yeah. So I'm now then also looking at the products and thinking we've got, there's a difficulty on attraction, a difficulty on retention. And then we also have got this problem of tokens in that users are being asked to understand these new economies. Yeah. And these, you know, I mean, I go to, I don't know about you, I go on holiday and I have a rough calculation of the exchange rate in my head and I kind of know how much I've spent. People are going to be using products with a token A that has a certain value, a token B that has another value, with market makers changing the value, with volatility, and I just can't see that working on a consumer level. No, well, that's it. I look, the, the point is, um, you know, very few people uh, understand HTTP or need to. Mm. And, you know, I've always said this. I think the crypto space, place or blockchain space or, you know, whatever you want to call it, is going to be most impactful when it's invisible. Um, and I think once, once you start to combine this infrastructure with machine learning and AI, um, where the system becomes intuitive and it's just transacting with itself. And by the way, when you're designing economies, you're thinking through behavioral economics, having rational, logical machines is a lot easier, um, than people, mm-hmm. um, as economists, you know, traditional economists, uh, know all too well, um, People are inherently irrational, and make, they make decisions that are often counter to their own self-interest. Um, but machines generally don't. And so I think for us, that's what's really interesting is when you start to look at within the context of convergence, um, the idea that DLT starts combining with machine learning, uh, and then you have these kind of incentives and disincentives through the tokens um, that we're no longer just talking about people were talking about machines and so again fetch is a really good instance of that where most of the magic for fetch in the future will happen behind the scenes you're just presented with some you're rerouted on your journey um you don't know why or how um other than maybe you might have set some parameters about your life choices how you would like the system to make decisions on your behalf mm-hmm. um but then the system goes out and and and, and your, your representative your agent goes out and and makes those decisions and will probably be more rational in making those decisions on your behalf based on your self-confessed moral compass or or uh, whatever it is um such as you know your 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 um your carbon footprint or whatever for for transportation so you know i i think What's happened is that you've got this huge brain trust. I'd argue, if you compare it to pretty much anything else, there's this amazing brain trust that's come around this industry, you know, that we loosely call crypto. Um, and, you know, once you go down that rabbit hole um, and you're very technically able, certainly more technically able than me, you know, you, you will go down uh, a rabbit hole of a, a million scenarios um, and you start building for a future uh, that's made on a lot of assumptions. And to be honest with you, and understandably, nobody wants to build boring stuff, right? Um, the boring stuff's not sexy. Um, the plumbing and the piping's just uh, not sexy when you can think about, you know, autonomous economic systems and all, all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a bit of a gap between people solving the boring problems and, um, and uh, and then you have kind of this other group of people that are uh, kind of solving the future, maybe even two steps ahead um, of of where we are now. So so yeah, I, I think the the should definitely be the focus, and this is why beginning of uh, this year I wrote that post of Back to the Future. Let's get back to building the future 
Um, but kind of, you know, one, one step at a time, what's the critical infrastructure that we need to be putting in place? Um, uh, rather than rushing to kind of realize even applications at the top, because we know once all this is there, we know that blockchain will be applied to thousands of different use cases. It's just obvious, you know, once you get your head around decentralization. Um, but the reality is that's, that's very far out. And I think, you know, having large scale dApps being used by, by people where you could go into a pub and people would know it as well as they know conventional app, um, you know, I'd say we're still three, four, maybe even five years away. Right. Okay. So, so it's probably a good point to talk about then that what you wrote about the path to decentralization. Um, can you talk about that? And, and I'll share the article out on the show notes, but can you yeah. explain your thinking when you wrote that? So um, the, the kind of thinking around the pathway to decentralization was really triggered by recent commentary by the SEC around uh, how they would determine whether a token is a utility token or a security token. Um, and they listed uh, uh, decentralization as a, a key measure. And obviously, there are many problems with that. How do you measure decentralization? Um, and it kind of asked more questions than it, than it gave answers. And then when they followed up with, with saying they felt that Ethereum, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and again, not picking on Ethereum, but this is just their commentary, um, Ethereum based on what it is today, not necessarily how it was previously, um, is very likely not a security um, because of its high degrees of decentralization. And again, you know, if you, if you try to quantify that, um, or, or any project actually in space, and there's a really interesting site called um, uh, How Decentralized Are We? I've seen it, yeah. Dot com. Is that Jackson Palmer did that? I forget the name of the The, 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 the Dogecoin guy. I'm not sure. I'm not okay. sure, to be honest. I'll dig it out. Um, and it has huge gaps, so it doesn't cover IOTA and EOS and a, a number of others. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless, and he kind, of, um, he kind of breaks down how you might try to quantify how decentralized uh, a network is. Um, and on most measures, it, it's very difficult to say most of the popular uh, networks that we know and love or hate um, are very decentralized. They're actually... Um, pretty decentralized at different levels. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of commentary that uh, I think it was, uh, William Hinman of the SEC said was a decentralized project is one uh, with the absence of a central third party promoter whose efforts are a key determining factor in the enterprise uh, through developing the asset, building the network, use of proceeds to enhance functionality, exercise of governance rights, retaining of a significant stake. Um, and again, you know, that's a really high bar and I would argue almost none of, uh, none of the protocols as they are today meet, meet that bar. Mm-hmm. So it begs the question, you know, how they've determined some things are or aren't. But the reason why this is important as a driving factor is, you know, decentralization has always been the thing projects get beaten with. So if somebody wants to critique a project, it's you're not decentralized um, on whatever level. Um, and uh, the reality is most aren't. And then even what is decentralization? Um, is it even desirable in every level? Is it practically um, uh, relevant for it to be? And then there's also a staging question. At what stage, and this is really the pathway piece, at what stage is it appropriate to be decentralized? Because usually decentralized means um, uh, you know, committing, uh, committing to codifying something, hard coding it, um, which then makes it fragile. I mean, you've got to be really sure... Um, the design choice that you want to codify, and the only way to correct that is, you know, through some significant um, potential hard forks, or, or and could potentially lead to a constitutional crisis. Um, you got to you got to have really high degrees of surety, uh, and you know, kind of circling back to what we were saying earlier about lean uh, lean business principles, lean startup principles. Um, you know, there's such a period of this kind of cycles of experimentation and validation before you commit something to code. So, you know, usually you'd build this thing that looks like the product, you get people to play with it, uh, and then if they, if they used it in the appropriate way, then you'd build the back end. Then you'd kind of commit it to code. Um, and so it's amazing that not much of that thinking has been brought into um, the crypto space. It's interesting because um, 
I've been going down the Bitcoin maximalism rabbit hole recently, just trying to understand it, trying to understand um, why they are so anti every other project. And I've kind of come to the conclusion that I understand, I fully understand the argument that there, there will only be one winner in the digital store of value. Um, there could be other players, but they'll, have a, they'll take a much smaller percent of the market because everyone will gravitate towards um, the leading uh, store value, which is similar to gold and silver. So I understand that. But one thing I don't agree with and I struggle with is where they have, um, where the maximalists will say that a blockchain is only useful for censorship resistance and uh, immutable records and no, no, nothing else should use it. Therefore, nothing else needs to be on a blockchain. But I actually see multiple blockchains and the ability to buy and sell between different tokens as a way of transferring value around different projects around the ecosystem. So in my mind, it, not everything does need to be as decentralized. And even though I don't like the EOS project, I understand what they're trying to do. I understand that uh, Carl Somani talks about the trade-offs between speed and decentralization. I, I understand uh, the trade-off in that there, that by being less decentralized, you can have you have less issues with scaling. Well, I mean, and I think linked to that, it's, it's, it's what do people want, right? So, you know, if there wasn't a requirement for things like EOS with their design choices, people wouldn't use it. Yeah. So I, I think there's this idea that people who are dogmatic in a particular position of what they think um, Web3 should look like and how decentralized they think it should be um, is very different from... You, you, can't, you can't shout at somebody to use something and find it useful. Um, and so ultimately, I'm for all kinds of experimentation in space, especially around governance, especially around degrees of decentralization um, to inform scaling. You know, we personally are only invested in, uh, only interested in investing in open source, tokenized um, infrastructure. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity for things that might not be tokenized. Um, that uh, might be uh, might not be wholly open sourced. Uh, we just think, uh, in the scheme of things, they're going to struggle to compete. And this is an in another interesting thing about the EOS model, and it kind of pairs actually the hungry protocol concept to the pathway to decentralization. So, um, the hungry protocol thesis is uh, effectively saying that if you take as, as an extension of um, uh, the FAT protocol. These protocols that tokenize are able to raise a significant amount of capital. Um, and they are then able to deploy that capital to get, uh, to accelerate network market fit. So again, a lot of things we were talking about, about things being usable, things being integrated into our daily lives, that could happen organically. Um, or uh, you could have a very large amount of capital um, to pump into accelerators and incubators or uh, old-fashioned mergers and acquisitions. And so you know, this year, we track the space. We've seen more mergers and acquisitions happen um, in the first half of this year than all of last year. I think it's something like two or three times the year previous. Um, as kind of protocols that have this large endowment of capital, cash, tokens, however they want to use it, so EOS has got a billion, I think it's 25% of the capital they raised was explicitly for a venture arm. Um, you know, they are doing a range of things. They're going to traditional VCs that invest in real businesses and are equipped to assess real businesses. Um, and they're saying, look, we'll give you 20 million. Um, I don't know whether it's in tokens or cash. Um, you match it with 20 million, but you can only invest in businesses that build on top of EOS. Um, or, you know, you're seeing um, different types of acquisition happen as people are scaling their technical teams, their acquihiring. They're buying um, companies that have a banking license like Litecoin. Um, they're buying businesses that um, aren't yet tokenized, but they have a real business with real customers um, who are protocol agnostic in a way, um, and they will just buy them outright integrate them into their protocol, and all of a sudden they can start to realize several layers of network market fit that's usable. So 
Yeah, I, I think for whether you like it or not, and there is a debate on whether this is good for the system, I think it, it's going to create this frenzy of acquisitions. Everyone's going to become very acquisitive. Um, and in a way, protocols start to become funds, almost like private equity uh, firms, you know, where they have a thesis, um, they're looking to make synergistic investments and then try to combine them to grow market share. Um, and, and that's going to become incredibly aggressive. This is an area that outliers looking to build as a practice for our portfolio is how can you strategically deploy your capital and your holdings to accelerate network market fit. Um, so, um, so that's why you know, it's basically how the, how the protocol stays fat or how's it, how it gets fat, depending on your perspective. That's what's called the hungry protocol. Yeah, and we'll come to that, actually. So a couple of qu- think points off that. So that's where EOS is interesting. So outside of the ethical argument of raising $4 billion, they have a war chest now to push people towards building on EOS. Yeah. Um, then the second, but the thing I really wanted to ask you, therefore, and I think we might have covered this in our last interview, but so for you as a venture firm, are you investing in the enterprise or in the token or both? So... The, the, the major investment opportunity for us is in the token. Right. Um, so that's where we see uh, the most value. That's where um, we would have the most holdings, and that could be anything from 3% to 7% of the token supply. Um, and obviously, you know, we see that in terms of a cycle. So we look at the project typically in a 10-year cycle. If we're advising the design of that network, um, then obviously we have a greater feel on the cycle in terms of when it might hit equilibrium. So obviously when a token hits equilibrium in a network, it's of less speculative value. So you really, it's speculative when you need to encourage early adopters to build on a network and bring value and build it out. But ideally when it, when it optimizes, um, there's less speculative value and it's just more uh, um, of direct utility into the network. So, you know, we... Uh, we're we're riding that speculative wave. Um, we do, in some instances, invest increasingly, actually, in the equity of a company in advance of a token. Um, and that's usually because you have more rights, to be honest with you. You have zero rights if you're investing in a SAFT. It's, it's a promise. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's it's really interesting seeing projects raise lots of money and then actively not deliver on what they said they were going to deliver on because it's too hard, um, and just say, well, we're going to become a fund because mm-hmm. that's usually not what they've been given capital for, although increasingly uh, that, that is part, part of the proposition. So we, we, we'll make an equity-based investment. Um, sometimes we might invest in a SAFT, and that SAFT will have the rights to equity if there's a no token or the token takes too long. Um, but principally, you know, we're only really interested in a project if it's going to be open source tokenized infrastructure. So compared to a traditional venture firm, your, the extraction of value will be the selling of the tokens you hold. Over time. Yeah. Over time, um, which is a very different model. But it's, it's almost an entirely new model, right? Because venture firms don't traditionally sell off parts of their investment a little bit at a time, unless it, I guess, I mean, this is my background and my experience, unless unless there's an IPO and they're selling off their shares. Yeah, there's a capital event. Yeah. And usually that's what everything's geared towards. Yeah. You know, you're you're looking for uh, an acquisition um, or you're looking for your IPO and, uh, you know, typical VC firm is geared towards that. And by the way, there's as much pump and dump that happens in that, if not more, than crypto. Mm -hmm. Um... But uh, so our, our model is, you know, we, we've we've invested in that full cycle, and you know, we we have a feeling for how to to measure network health and and its journey to that point of equilibrium, um, and we will sensibly sell off tokens into the market over that full cycle, um, uh, in a way that um, helps make markets, um, um, but doesn't kind of disturb. Obviously, we have a, a large amount of token supply. So, um, you know, if, if we dumped that onto a market, you'd notice it probably kill the network. Um, so, 
I mean, it just wouldn't be sensible to, to, to do that if you wanted to realize the full value of, of your token. Um, obviously, some people dump the token because they don't care or believe in the long-term value of, 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 of their network. A lot of crypto pools do that. Um, but actually, in many instances, our holdings, certainly the advisory holdings, vest. So again, kind of an age-old, um, well-worn path with venture, which is, you know, our holdings vest alongside the founding teams, and that could be over several years. So it could be three years, five years. Um, so, um, so even if we wanted to, we couldn't. But that's just not inherent into our our model. Have you extracted any value yet? Is, is it something you started? Yeah. So, you know, general rule of thumb is there is obviously a capital outlay um, for outlier involved in any project, especially. Um, if we've underwritten the project for two years, so we have some projects. I mean, we've got, thankfully, several projects all doing a token sale towards the end of this year. Um, but on average, you know, we would have underwritten that process for anything from a year to two years. I don't think there's any less, um, any less than a year. Um, and so that's we've had our money locked up. Um, and so you know, when there is a token sale. You know, we will look to get. Uh, we're a very capital efficient business, so you know the, the amount of capital we deploy, in the scheme of things, is is very little, um, direct capital. But obviously, we have this infrastructure that we're building with um, twenty partners, thirty members of staff. It's not inconceivable we could be a hundred this time next year, um, as we look to provide value uh, to our portfolio through their full cycle. So the first one is token design and token sale. Next one is kind of governance, enterprise engagement, mergers and acquisitions. So our objective is how can we maximize the value for us, for the market, for the project and founders that we're involved in. That requires a huge amount of investment. At the moment, all of our investment's been upfront. And so typically what we'll look to do is to make two, three X on our upfront investment um, on each project, which is very easy to do if you've been the first investor in, almost friends and family round. Um, and by the point that there's a token sale, um, the project's already raised, maybe even deployed 15, 20, 30 million. It's built a product. It's being used by enterprise. So by the time something's sold to the public, this is a live network with clear demonstrable utility. The, we've, already, we've already generated a lot of values. It's very easy for us to get two, three back on the hard capital that we put into that early stage. Um, That's very different from most other uh, ICOs in crypto, which are often trading on an exchange before they've built anything or establish any value. Yeah. So one of the things that's um, frustrated a lot of people with Outlier Ventures investments is that you go into a Telegram channel, and I'm not going to name names, but some of them have you know, 14,000, 15,000 um, people in there, very actively engaged community. Um, and the project will not talk about its token sale at all. Um, and it won't do that because generally uh, it may be raising private money, it may be deploying that private money um, and building out the product, and it will only talk about a token sale when it is no longer raising money um, through private sales. Now, that doesn't mean it's excluding people. You can contact them and ask them, and, and if you pass the criteria... You can probably invest, but they are not promoting an ICO. Um, and then, you know, when they do start talking about this token sale, um, you will first probably have to do something to join the network before you can purchase a token. So you have to become a network participant. Um, you can't just be a speculator. Um, and then at the point where you can actually purchase that token, you will be able to use it in that network. And that network will already be being used um, potentially by several enterprise partners who would have been using their test net previously. So um, it, they're very unlike other projects. Um, to be honest with you, I don't think there's a proper appreciation for this yet, but there will be as these all come off the ramp by the end of this year. I think there'll be a clear difference and you see the quality and there will be a premium, right? You will be paying a premium for that um, if you want to come and participate in the system um, but it will be a, a live network and there's a lot of money and time and thinking that's gone into it um, and yeah, time will tell but ultimately because we're locked into the long-term value of this system uh, we have to be sure 
the, the, the economic decisions are viable, the governance is right, governance, treasury management, how are they going to manage their capital and deploy it in a way that's going to grow network value? Um, so there's a lot of thinking and processes that are put in place behind the scenes that will ultimately make our investments more sustainable. Um, and again, you know, time will reveal that. People don't appreciate it now because everybody says that. But over time, I think this should become really, um, really apparent. And then I think increasingly there'll be that expectation from outlier projects. I think that is a big differentiator. How are you feeling about the token sales? Because uh, obviously there was an ICO boom last year and early this year, but most, almost all ICOs I look at now are struggling to hit their hard caps. Yeah. Um, do you think you, your ICOs will be seen differently because of the hard work you've done up front? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, you never know, yeah. right? Um, these projects, by the time they do their token sale, uh, would have already raised and deployed anything from five to 30 million. Right. So they've already raised money um, and from professional investors who've done their due diligence and are, and are happy with all the things that a professional investor would want to see. Um, they are all, of course, coming into a market where still everything is correlated to Bitcoin. And that is correlated to, you know, it's kind of over sensitive to a positive news or negative news. There's no real rationale in the market. I mean, I always find it fascinating. People kind of create these trading charts and predict where it's going to go. But then, you know, the SEC says something and it all goes to shit. Mm. So, you know, we, we kind of, when we've designed these systems, um, we've designed them to last. We've designed them to function um, initially you know, on their own. Um, and there really shouldn't be a correlation between that and any other asset. However, that's just not how the market works. So ultimately, um, it impacts the, the price that projects are able to invest at. Actually, it's in, in the kind of pre-sales, it's impacted how much, you know, if we're in a bear market, people are going, well, I'd rather hold on to Ethereum, that's going to appreciate buying X, my Ether, rather than deploy it into a, a project that I know will have uh, more long-term upside. So it's really when people think they want to come in and out and a lot of our projects have lock-ins. So, you know, Ocean's um, lock-in for any investors over a year. Right. Um, so you've really got to believe in the network. Mm. You can't just be somebody that's wanting to recycle your capital. So, But it's a more and more mature approach to what has actually been quite an immature market. Yeah. And, look, and I think, so when I wrote that, um, calling for this kind of crypto winter, beginning part of the year, it was to bring some sense into the market where people stopped tracing the pump and that stopped kind of yeah tracing chasing the pump and dump um and started to say okay look because i think everyone's seen the downside of that now i think before there was no downside so the the game theory behind that was well why wouldn't you be just flipping your money why would you be looking for anything of value why would you even care because there were plenty of things that had no value everyone knew that um and yet they could still make lots of money i think the rules of the game are changing which is a really good thing people start to have to look for value They'll hopefully, you'll still get traders, but some people will start to say, well, actually, look, you know what? I played the trading game. I lost a load of money. Um, it's better for me to just try to find things that I believe in long term and park my capital in that and get on with my actual job that pays the bills and pays the rent. Um, I almost feel like we've got this wipeout that's still to come in that there are still a lot of uh, token projects out there who have sat on funds. Yeah. Who are probably not going to deploy something anyone's anyone's going to use. They're going to struggle with traction, and uh, I still think there's a, probably a, a hell of a lot of ETH still to be sold back into the market. Whilst there's probably less um, less ICOs out there which people want to invest in. So I think there's a lot more downward sell pressure on ETH to come. Yeah. And I think we've got this kind of death spiral to go. And I, I feel like that's when almost this bear market will end. And that will wipe out a number of these projects. And almost similar to the dot-com bubble, you know, some will survive. We'll have our Amazon, our Google, our Facebook. But we will then have that next round where the rules of the game will have changed and everyone will have learned from this yeah. first phase. And there's three things that will, you know, very crudely, there are three things that will be the differentiator between those that fail and, and those that are still here in three years. Um, obviously, there's some some technical decisioning, which is very difficult to predict. You know, the things that the innovations we think are going to be the future now might not be those 
um, uh, in, in three, four, five years' time, 10 years' time. But there's some basic ones, you know, that is, um, have they got the token distribution right? So just the sales process themselves, have they made sure that the tokens are in the right people's hands or they will be in the right people's hands? Um, uh, what, is, what is the treasury management of their holdings? You know, have they, uh, have they just held it all in F, thinking it's going to continually go up? Um, and what is the governance that's in place? How they make decisions? So these kind of basic things. Um, and then, of course, you know, the actual economic design. Um, the combination of these things will, will give resilience to projects that will still be there. And by the way, I think, coming back to the Hungry Protocol thesis, there is opportunity in the winter if you are a well-capitalized project that has all of those things right, um, coming into a market where there might be a foundation that's totally screwed something up, be it just basic governance, be it they've run out of money, um, that are acquisition targets, either just for the team. Um, so, you know, I've kind of played around with some concepts about what uh, acquisition could look, mergers and acquisition could look like. And, you know, we're seeing things like, I call it the cuckoo. Um, so I don't know if you know, but the, the cuckoo basically lays a, an egg in another bird's nest and allows the other bird to kind of hatch it. And we're seeing a lot of well-capitalized protocols that might not even be the best technology who are approaching projects that are about to ICO and say, don't use our token and we'll give you 25, 30 million of our, our token or our capital, ideally our token, and you just build on our network. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, things like I call uh, the, 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 the missionary where you're, you're, um, you're approaching projects that aren't yet converted to crypto and you're kind of acquiring them. But there's other interesting ones like, um, so I've heard recently, I don't know it's a rumor, but um, Nexo were talking about buying or taking over the SALT network. Now, I'm not sure how that would work. And I think SALT have just disputed it, but apparently, you know, they've burnt through a load of cash. Mm. They're in financial trouble to, to, to govern the, the foundation again. Can't verify that at all, it's just a rumor. Um, but it's interesting, you've got one entity saying, well, you know what, we'll take over that network, we'll merge you somehow into ours. So, you know, there will be some residual value out there, whether it's network participants, nodes, um, uh, that, that kind of newly minted protocols can begin to go into and acquire. And I think that's where it starts to get really interesting. Do you think there's a, um, there's a, probably a wider need for stable coins in all of this because one of the things i also struggle with is is the uh is the is the volatility and and actually i think for wider institutional investment i don't think um these institutional investors are going to be happy with the volatility of these tokens they don't understand when actually a stable coin does the job so many projects are now having two tokens in the system to kind of counterbalance this you know they have the one which is the way you can exchange value in and out of the system. And then you have the one that's actually driving the kind of core utility. So they're able in a way to kind of have their own stable coin in, in that network to remove the volatility. But actually, I think volatility is a broader topic, which is, you know, these capital markets are incredibly um, they're in an adolescent stage, right? They're really inefficient. So um, there's a project we're working with at the moment that addresses explicitly this, um, where you look at the pairings between um, these growing number of tokens, um, the difference between exchanges is huge. So just some basic kind of algorithmic stuff, um, algorithmic trading can allow you to, to tap into that. And then there's some interesting innovations around, you know, how could you tap into the kind of collective long tail of holdings um, to kind of create a decentralized form of liquidity. Um, between all these pairings. Um, and this is an investment we'll talk about uh, in the near future. Um, but effectively, you know, l l the, this kind of volatility is primarily driven by uh, thin liquidity. Um, and there are some basic innovations that can come through that can kind of remove that. Um, and so at the moment, this volatility is, you know, people, if you're, a, if you're a hedge fund, you love volatility. <clears throat> and they've got enough capital where they, they can deploy it. It's opaque. They can market manipulate. Most of it's not security, so um, most of the, the normal rules don't apply. Um, 
and and so you know we, we've we've kind of got this uh, yeah hyper volatile system. I think all of that will gradually be ironed out. Whether it's um, stable coins, whether it's new forms of uh, market making and decentralized liquidity solutions. Um, uh, so I, I kind of our focus is to date been less concerned with all that stuff. So we kind of accept that most of our tokens um, will experience degrees of volatility. You know, we try to design ways to, to manage that or minimize it. Um, but you know, we're, we're not going to be watching the daily price movement on our tokens. I think that would be incredibly distracting. And this is one of the big distractions for most protocols out there is that they're, they're public companies, right? And this is why a lot of projects don't go public for any number of reasons because it's a pain in the ass from a regulatory perspective, but also because the attention changes. The attention is much much more short-termist. It's how can we move the needle on the price. Well, isn't this what Elon Musk yeah, did exactly. yesterday? Exactly. You know, he wants to take Tesla private because of the distraction. And, exactly. And probably because he has to be the key driver of the PR that keeps the price high. Right. And, I, you know, I think... You know, I mean, that's that's uh, the, the Elon Musk debates almost as contentious as crypt anything in crypto. But, but yeah, I mean, his argument is: look, if if you're interested in all that stuff, you know, the, these kind of short term reportings, um, then you shouldn't be investing in Tesla because we're doing something bigger, and that requires patience and a more long term outlook. But that's very difficult mm-hmm. to do if you're a public company. Yeah. So again, this is one of the challenges with these kind of tokenized companies: is they're public companies without all the usual infrastructure of being a public company, how you manage communicating with the market and shareholders. Okay, look, before we finish up, there's just one thing in my notes that I haven't fully covered yet. We talked about the path to decentralization, but one thing I don't fully understand, it's probably because I'm not close enough to it, is the, the actual steps that yeah. this, this goes through. And I know you've written about it. Can you just explain that to me? Yeah, so basically, it's kind of... Um, what, what we've created is a, an agile process, and it's really come about from the work that we're doing with our various projects and the decisions that they're having to make um, as they work through the degrees of utility that they have in the network, um, how they're going to govern that network when it's live, um, within the kind of regulatory environment that we're in and the ambiguity that exists within that. So, you know, decentralization to date has prim- primarily a, a technical discussion, you know, so it's an, an, a, almost a political ideal. So the, it's a starting point. Most projects start from the, the point of decentralization. So this is how decentralized we want to be. We must be that decentralized at, at day one. Um, and actually what, what, what we're seeing with our projects is that um, it's this pathway. It kind of, it's not, Linear, you know, you, you move around quite a lot um, as the rubber hits the tarmac. And so there are kind of some key milestones uh, along that journey to decentralization. So we do have the discussion when we're thinking through token design and, and thinking through the ledger and consensus mechanisms. How decentralized is it? How sensible is it um, to be, to what degree of decentralization is it sensible? Um, for, for your network in the context of its utility and in the context of its regulatory compliance. So if you're hoping for your network to interface with the insurance industry or the banking industry, then there are many different considerations ar- around centralization and decentralization. Um, but you know, ultimately, uh, you're, you're thinking through a couple of key milestones. And so one is, and it's slightly arbitrary, but, and, and this is a really challenging one, which is full functionality. So, you know, we believe you need to be looking at decentralization in terms of codifying governance um, in, in parallel to the token sale process or, you know, ultimately who is joining the system and at what stage? Um, who and where is it appropriate that somebody can enter that system, especially when you start considering retail users or investors or whatever you want to call them? Um, so full functionality is a phrase used by the SEC, um, which they determine is a key criteria as to when the public should be able to participate in buying tokens. And obviously, in a protocol that's open source, 
how can you ever say it's got full functionality? Because <laughs> functionality is evolving and it's developing. But they have this determination. And so loosely, you know, we, we kind of say, well, what is the minimal viable um, utility? So again, another, uh, another reference of minimal viable something. So what's the minimal viable utility the network needs to demonstrate for us to be able to satisfy this regulatory requirement for full functionality? Um, and, um, and then the second one is this network market fit. So, you know, how until we reach network market fit in at least one uh, market vertical, we believe that decisioning and governance should be uh, wet, it involves people, be quite analog. Um, but if we borrow the learnings from open source systems, be incredibly um, transparent. So kind of this uh, ultra transparency. Um, and if you actually look at the history of open source, um, it's easy to say it's distributed. It's not so easy to say it's decentralized um, because most of the activity in open source systems, um, so whilst it's open to contribution from anybody and everybody, and it can be quite egalitarian, um, decision-making is hierarchical, and often there's a benevolent dictator there. So if you look at Linux or Mozilla or any of the projects, you know, ultimately, somebody calls the shots. And that allows the project to move forward and not get um, bogged down in trying to satisfy every possible opinion. And in reality, we kind of see that in other protocols. I'm not going to name them, but, you know, there's the debate about, you know, do we have these individuals that carry a lot of weight in the ultimate governance of a particular network? Well, I'll, I'll name Vitalik and Ethereum is a very obvious case. Sure. And I think... I think that's where you have the clear separation between Ethereum and Bitcoin and their levels of decentralization. Right. Because there is no Vitalik in Bitcoin. Right. And that's probably the genius of Satoshi, who he, she, they are um, in that. So I actually, I think, if, if you ask me, I think the SEC decision on Ethereum was really, um, it, it made less sense than it, was, than it was. What I'm trying to get at is that I think they fudged it because I didn't, don't think they wanted to stifle innovation and deal with the headache of potentially having to put a whole bunch of people in jail. Yeah. Well, and also, um, who would go to jail? And, you know, it's if you look at who the SEC and regulators are going after, it's outright fraud. Mm -hmm. So their main focus is what is the intent, right? Is the intent to defraud people? Or is the intent to genuinely build a technical innovation? Now, you know, within that, there are nuances. Um, and, you know, they're going to be less, without legal precedent, they're going to be much more cautious about taking a project that has a billion dollars in the bank to court, where they might potentially lose, than they are just picking off low-hanging fruit who are carrying out outright fraud. But they're trying to give a guide. And so, you know, for us, thinking through... Um, as you're navigating that journey, we believe, ideally not concentrated in, in, an, in an individual, but certainly uh, a group of committees with subcommittees, um, with decision-making that is transparent and auditable, and of course we've got all the characteristics of blockchains to allow us to make that happen, uh, we believe is a sensible way to realize innovation. You've got to remember in the early stages, there's a, there's a reason why consortia often fail. And, and where startup can really succeed. And it's because often startups don't ask for permission, while a consortia explicitly has to go and try and find consensus amongst the group of conflicting uh, stakeholders. And so, you know, you've got to be pragmatic about this stuff. You've got to say, well, look, how do we get from A to B, or A to B to C? How do we get there as quickly as possible? Um, uh, whilst keeping the majority of the network with us. And it's that this fine dance that you've got to make. We believe, if you look at the history of open source, as long as you're transparent and you set out the pathways, you say, look, this is how decentralized we want to be. This is how we want to get there. These are the steps it's going to take to get there. This is why we think we need to be centralized in these areas to start with. Um, I think any sensible person... Um, is going to be okay with that. Yeah. And I, like I say, I don't think they want to stifle innovation. And 
by deeming uh, Ethereum a security, it essentially wipes out a whole section of potential innovation. And I think it just takes it away from America. Sure. Well, yeah, I mean, so the, the reason why the SEC were a member of a number of different bodies, Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, um, where we go on Wharton, it's called Wharton Retreats. Um, so until today, I think we've been the only VC. The rest are all the regulators from around the world and all the leading law firms. Right. And it's Chatham House Rules, so you can't talk about what's said there. But we've had the fortune of being at these weekend retreats with the regulators where they talk an o- openly about um, what they want to stop, what their obligations are, what they think they can stop, let alone what they want to stop, and what they want to encourage. And the general theme across all of those is that they don't want to stifle innovation. Um, some are more protectionist um, on existing industries in the centers of capital that they might have, whether it's VC centers of capital or, or uh, um, you know, financial centers for, for the secondary markets. Um, others have nothing to lose. Uh, that, um, some have more to lose than others. Um, so there's, of course, a political dimension to this. Um, but on the whole, um, everybody's largely the regulators are trying to protect retail investors from Ponzi schemes, yeah? and and they want to protect the market from outright fraud and outright market manipulation. That's their raison d'être. Right. Um, and and so. You know, from our perspective, we invest. We know we and our projects invest more time than most in trying to satisfy their requirements, while still going. Yeah, you know, we've got to move forward. So whilst there's ambiguity there, we've got to make a judgment call because we've got shit to build. Um, and in a way, regulators are catching up, with, but it, it requires good actors and it requires you to at least consider. Did, did I notice that you've taken on somebody in that role recently? Yes, we've got a head of uh, issuance and compliance, yeah. um, 15, 17 year securities lawyer, XHSBC, and a number of other entities. Um, so she's plugged into Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. We've just joined um, uh, another one in North America. Um, we feed into things like the Crypto Assets Task Force in the UK. Um, we're a member of the Blockchain Working Group for the EU. Um, and like several other things. So we've, I would say, of our entire you know, 30 person team, maybe 20% of that goes to engaging with regulators, proactively engaging with them, um, and lawyers. Right. Um, and that allows us to, to have a greater level of confidence. So you know, most people uh, have just been scared off from, from stuff. Um, and to a degree, that's what regulators wanted, right? Some, the SEC certainly just wanted to put the fear of death into everybody so they'd start thinking rationally about what they're doing. Um, but, you know, I think that tone's changed now. A lot of regulators are, some of them are being proactive, some of them are being forced to react and be more responsive and provide greater clarity. But because of our proximity to them, we're, we're very, very bullish that um, a lot of the concerns around crypto assets will be almost entirely removed in the next couple of years for sure. Fantastic. It's been great again, Jamie. Good to um, chat. Do you want to tell me, just finish off by telling me what's coming up for you guys, um, how people can stay in touch and who you want to hear from, and I'll share out all the links in the show notes too. Yeah, so um, we're, we've got several token sales happening towards the end of this year. Um, so, you know, if you follow our projects, they might not have explicitly mentioned a date yet. They might be being slightly ambiguous about if it is or it isn't going to happen. Um, but uh, I can assure you that, that they are going to be happening this year and um, they will be able to talk about it in due course. So just kind of be patient with that process. We actually wrote a post recently on from our in-house securities lawyer about generally what we advise our projects can and can't say. So check that out and you'll, that, it will make sense as to why our projects behave and communicate in the way that they do. Um, uh, we've also making new investments, obviously. Um, so Hire was a very recent investment, which has lots of synergies um, to projects like Ocean, which is why Big Chain DB invested, Polychain, 
uh, followed us into that. Um, so that's going to be a really exciting project uh, that we'll be able to talk more about um, over the coming months. Um, and um, yeah, we're looking to kind of build upon some of these concepts, pathway to decentralization, hungry protocol. Um, we're about to release a very large thought leadership piece around token design and engineering, which is the product of about a year's worth of work, um, which is almost a book. It might even become a book. Wow. Um, so again, that's going to be a huge pleasure to be able to share that with the world. Um, so you know, keep your eyes out for that. And I guess the easiest way to track all that is to sign up to our newsletter, which you can do easily on our website, which is outlierventures.io. Um, and yeah, look forward to everyone's opinion and thinking. Most of the things that we put out there are, you know, they're definitely not fact, right? They're just to kind of stimulate debate. It's really to surface what we're thinking about and the work that we do. They're almost always half-baked. So um, always open to input and criticism. Brilliant. Great. Thanks again, Jamie. Always Thanks for having me on. Brilliant. Okay, so what did you make of that? Did you enjoy that interview with Jamie? If you haven't checked out the first interview, I do recommend it. It is pretty good. I think Jamie answered the question as well. You know, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I don't think Bitcoin is the only crypto project which is uh, worthy of investigating. I, I do understand it in terms of sound money. I do understand it in terms of a store of value that it is probably going to be the leading project. But I do think it is worth looking into other uses of blockchain and other uses of the technology. And I, you know, I like what Jamie's doing. I do like the projects and I do think there'll be an interesting test. So it was really good to meet up with Jamie and chat with him again. And at some point I'm going to be having an interview with a chap called Eden who works with him, who's head of their crypto economics mm -hmm. to kind of delve into that. Now I know there are other people in the space who say there is no such thing as crypto economics. There is only economics. And I get that. And that makes sense. But still, I do want to speak to Eden and, and I've got a bunch of questions I'd like to throw at him. Okay, so look, please do support the show. Please do leave me a review on iTunes. Follow me on social media. Uh, check out my website, www.whatbitcoindid.com and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com and as I mentioned in the intro, I'm off to LA on Monday. I'll be there for three weeks including a little trip up to San Fran and it'd be great to meet some of you or hang out with some of you if, you, if you're interested in that. Okay, I hope you all have a great week and I'll see you soon. Thank you.